Hey everyone, I hope you're doing great, and since it's Friday, you know what that means. It's time for another episode of this new-ish now, weekly podcast type thing that I do. Basically a third video. But the difference is, this one isn't just strictly stories, it's more conversational. More just talking about things. So far I've talked about reality glitches, I've talked about alien encounters, I've talked about being fired from a job because a ghost said that you stole something. So, in, on the Friday show, we really talk about a variety of things, and this week it's no different. We're going to focus on Europe, mostly Eastern Europe and Scandinavia. And just a heads up, the video this Sunday is also about Eastern Europe, so definitely tune in for that because it's a really good one. And as usual, if I use any articles, then I'll put them in the description below. But this one right here, it's just a simple top 10, but it talks about... All kinds of cryptids, urban legends, and myths, and all that stuff from Eastern Europe. And to start us off, I'll talk about the Strigoi. Now some people say that the Strigoi is where the story of the vampire and the werewolf come from. Now, like vampires, Strigoi are night-dwelling supernatural creatures, but they can also shapeshift into pretty much anything they want to. They can also, in some cases, make themselves invisible. Now you can see how both an undead human and possibly a werewolf type creature would, could come from this because it can shapeshift into pretty much anything it wants and it does this because it wants to get you and it wants to drink your blood basically. And to follow up with that I have this article about an alleged encounter with the Strigoi. The article is titled Villagers Decry Police Investigation into Vampire Slaying. Now the site is behind a paywall, but on my browser I have a speed reader thing so I can get the gist of the article. But it starts off in Romania, and it says, Before Toma Peter's relatives pulled his body from the grave, ripped out his heart, burned it to ashes, mixed it with water and drank it, he hadn't been in the news that much. That's often the way here with vampires, quiet lives, active deaths. Villagers here aren't up in arms about the undead, they're pretty common, but they are outraged that the police are involved in a simple vampire slang. After all, vampire slang is an accepted, though hidden, bit of a national heritage, even if illegal. So the sister of the guy who was apparently a vampire said what did we do? If they're right, he was already dead. If we're right, we killed a vampire and saved three lives. Is that so wrong? According to Romanian state police, this is wrong. As you can imagine, they don't really acknowledge that vampires exist and they consider this to be desecration of a grave. Now here in North America, especially where I live in Canada, vampires are seen as basically like a kid's cartoon. It's not that serious, it's more uh, infantilized, I guess. But in Romania, it's a very serious topic. And this particular encounter, I guess is the word for it, took place in a small village that's a hundred miles southwest of Bucharest. It also notes here in the article that the vampire slaying is a custom that's passed down from mother to daughter, father to son, and it's been this way for as long as anybody can remember, for generations beyond memory. So this particular encounter from 2004 kind of goes like this. After Peter died, his brother-in-law's daughter-in-law and granddaughter fell very ill. And when this happened so shortly after his death, he figured it was his brother-in-law. So he had to go to the cemetery. Now this first time he went there, he was very scared, as you can imagine. Now when he got there, he was obviously feeling a mix of emotions, so he drank a bit. And by the time that he got there, he didn't feel like he could use the shovel. So he'd returned the next night with a proper amount of courage and sober and was successful. When he dug up the body, he said that he found Peter on his side, his mouth bloody, his heart squeaked and jumped as it was burned, which in Romania is how you know it's a vampire. You burn it in an iron pan and if the heart jumps and squeaks like a mouse, then you know that you were right, and it was a vampire. And after this, you have to get the ill relatives to drink the ashes mixed with water. 
and in this case, after the heart was burned, it was mixed with water and taken to those who were sick, and it worked. His own son said that it was a miracle because he too fell ill. He was in bed for weeks, couldn't walk, his chest was aching, his head was pounding. But after he drank this, he felt fine. He was able to get up and walk for the first time in weeks. Which just from this encounter alone, you can probably agree with me that regardless of what's happening in Romania, it's going to be intense as hell and it's going to be scary. So, the next one I have here is called a Jengangar, which kind of reminds me of the Pokemon Gengar, but it's not like your normal everyday ghost. While this Scandinavian spirit lacks a normal repertoire of paranormal faucets, it can't go through walls, and it can't make the ceiling drip red with blood, it can't do things like that. It does have a body that occupies physical space in the human world, and it's a master of spreading sickness and plague. If it touches you, your flesh begins to slowly wither until the creature's virus has worked its way to your heart. It presents similarly to a vampire, only without any of the more popular drawbacks of the creature. The Jengangar can survive in sunlight, and seems to take the lives of people because it wants to, not because it needs to. So in some way or some form, a lot of cryptids, and especially in history, like myths and urban legends and stuff, a lot of them do seem to do something like this, whether it be it steals your energy, whether it be it kind of follows you around, it seems that a lot of them, like, will, uh, quote, infect you, I guess is the right word for it. And when I hear a lot of these stories, I often wonder how it was found out what to do in response to these things. Like, you know how with medicine, we have, like, medical discoveries and stuff. Was it similar, but on a spiritual side? I've always kind of wondered how they came to know, especially in the case of the first one, how do they know to burn it on an iron skillet? And what would be more interesting is to find the very first case of a Strigoi, or in this case a Jengangar. I don't have a specific encounter for that one, so I'll just move on to the next one I have. A Prikalichi, which a lot of people will know in English as a werewolf or a dogman type thing. But now in Romania, a Prikalichi is the soul of a particularly violent man that has come back in the form of a huge, terrifying wolf. And now I probably don't need to describe a whole bunch of stuff about this because everybody's heard of the dog man now and werewolves and all that kind of stuff. And so next up, I do have some stories. This one in particular is from Serbia, and here it is. I'll get right into it. I was living in Serbia at the time this happened. It's important to know that the part of the country that I was living in was part of Hungary until the end of the First World War, when it lost 75% of its territory, and these territories were given to surrounding countries. So there are Hungarians living there. I'm one of them. It started somewhere in 2007. I was at church. It was Sunday. I was there together with some friends. Everything went as usual. We were bored and wanted to go home so we could play Counter-Strike against each other. When we came out of the church, the sky was blue, not a cloud on it. So I arrived home, sat down at the table with my family, said my prayers, ate my lunch, and went to my bedroom. I turned on my computer, and then I opened the game and selected the server that I wanted to play on. I started playing. About a half an hour later, my score was 30 to 5. I felt something touch my neck. Spontaneously, I turned around to see what it was, and there was nothing there. Now at this point, I was sure that it felt like a cold hand, but as I said, there was nothing there. I stopped playing, I went to see if somebody else was in the house, or like a stranger or something, but again, I was left with nothing. There's no way that anyone could hide before I would see him or her, because when it touched me, I turned around the same second, but I thought that there was some person playing around. Later that day, someone was screaming in a voice that sounded like it was straight from hell. The screaming went on for five to eight minutes. None of the neighbors screamed. No animal could make sounds that loud. 
The whole street heard it, and no one could tell where it was coming from. It went far beyond the limits of what computer software can make. Ever since, there is an evil presence in that house. I was living there for another five years with my family. The time I spent there was horrific. I was attacked every day by some unseen force. Attacks included, but were not limited to, scratches, being forced and pushed against the wall, picked up and thrown out of bed, locked in or out of rooms, and physically being thrown out the door. So something interesting that I've always found about poltergeist activity, or in this case, it can be a whole neighborhood, is how long it can just stay dormant and not do anything, and then suddenly it just shows up, and you have one hell of a time trying to get rid of it. Or in some cases, it kind of goes just as fast as it came. It shows up, does all this stuff for a day, and then leaves. It makes you really wonder, like, what's going on there? It's not something that I'm smart enough to understand or explain, but it would be cool to know why. That sometimes they just show up and leave. Like, is it all just about causing chaos and pain and stuff, and then when they get their fill, they just go on to the next one. It's really weird how those things work. It kind of is like a vampire almost. Attaches itself to you, or in the other case, infects you, and then it just kind of steals your life essence, your, your soul or your energy or whatever. And then when it has its fill, it just disappears, or in some bad cases, when the person dies, they go away, seemingly having accomplished their goal or exhausted a resource, you know. It's just so dehumanizing to look at it like that. And now another one. This one's from Poland. It says, I live in Poland and I've been living here for about two years now. In October, my best friend made a birthday party and invited me to it. I decided to ride the bus to her house. The buses here in Poland are all different and I personally prefer the new ones. So I took the bus and I stood in the very front where there's big windows where you can see out. I stood there as the buses stopped here and there. And then the bus stopped on one stop. And in front of the bus was this sidewalk where there was white lines in the ground. I was bored and staring out the windows when I saw a weird sight. I saw a small boy that was seemed to be dressed in a t-shirt and shorts. But he was made up of shadows. He seemed to be standing on the white lines, jumping on them. Nobody else seemed to acknowledge the boy or see that he was there. Suddenly I got interrupted because a woman wanted to get by me. I looked back and he was gone. I still remember what a strange sight it was. Plus, it was a cold day and everyone was wearing jackets. He still haunts my mind. So now as always, being in public and seeing a paranormal thing or a supernatural thing or even just really weird stuff it's always much different than seeing it in your house lots of people when they first see something in their house they're thinking oh damn i'm going crazy you know the walls are going to start talking to me kind of thing but in public even if it's your first time it always gives you pause because you look around to see if anybody else saw it first and then if no one else did you're like damn how did people not see that? It was just right there. And I have a sort of similar experience myself. I talked about it on the channel before, like a couple of years ago, I think. I was in this smaller city. Well, it's more like four towns all kind of put together. But you get the kind of vibe that I'm going for. It has a square area, or what would be like a downtown market area. And in this area, um, they usually have stuff set up for seasonal. There's shops there all year round. It's just a really cozy place to be. And this one time, I believe it was in the fall, but I don't remember like 100%. It may have been late summer. But anyway, the buildings there are quite old. And they've been there, some of them, for over 100 years. Maybe no, not quite 200, but over 100 years. And I see this boy standing in an alleyway. And I noticed that he is really wearing out-of-date clothing. Like it looks like from the turn of the century. 
And I thought, well, you know, there's always stuff going on down here. It could be like a historical reenactment or something. But the more I looked around, the more I didn't see any historical reenactment thing. I just saw this boy sitting there. So I thought, okay, that's weird because he's by himself. I was just trying to go through in my head like reasonable things or reasonable reasons why this kid would just be wearing turn of the century clothing. Eventually, I don't remember if I went up to the kid or if he went up to me, and I asked him if he needed help, or where his parents were. And this kid basically deadass looks at me and tells me that he died in the flood. And I'm thinking like, alright, there hasn't been a flood in like a hundred years. And then it kind of clicks, you know, in my head. And I turn around and look at the river. And I go to look back to the kid and the kid's gone. I have all the details written down somewhere, so I should probably just find that and just read that off, but that's the gist of what happened. It was really creepy. And again, since it was in public, I was looking around like, did anybody else see this? And I was like, no, just me? It's just me going crazy? Alright. But taking things back to this list, one of them that we've all heard of, because it's been in movies for at least the past 10 years, maybe longer, is the Baba Yaga. So for those who don't know, the Baba Yaga is from Slavic mythology, and she is basically your old witch in the forest story. Now, apparently in some stories, some versions of the story, she has iron teeth, an extremely long nose, and she has a hut which stands on chicken legs. She, in some cases, has a rooster's head on top, and is surrounded by a fence of human bones. But now, also, in some versions of the story, or some tales about her, she's not always evil. Sometimes she's benevolent, and in other ones she's very cruel and just plain chaotic evil. Basically, she seems to be morally ambiguous, and it says here, don't depend on her to save your life if you're ever lost in the forest. She might just take away your only means of survival and leave you to perish instead. And now if this is the case, and she's a witch in the forest, then I have a feeling that in the origins of this tale, there may have been something that got lost, like maybe she sees something in you and decides if you're worth saving or if she wants to save you. I don't know, I'm just spitballing an idea there. And the next one I have here is the Rusalki, and in Slavic folklore, there are attractive young women who were basically mermaids with legs. On some occasions, they entangle you in their hair, and they tickle you until you're either paralyzed or dead, and then they drag you off into the water. But, in a lot of them, the Rusalki are spirits of children who perished before being baptized, or the spirits of young women who drowned. It seems that this one shares a lot more in common with the mermaid stories, or I don't remember the name of it, but there is an African coastal story that I've heard a long time ago where children who were unbaptized or drowned in the water, they will appear to be drowning children asking for help, and when you go out, there's more than one of them. It's a trap, and then they wrap around you and drag you into the water as well. If I ever remember the name or find out more about it, I will talk about it in a future episode. And this one right here is called the Haster Man, who knits clothes for the souls he consumes. In Polish mythology, the Haster Man eats both children and adults. He does this by walking along riverbanks on the night of a full moon, crying like a child. And when you come up to him or he catches you, he basically eats you or consumes you. And now, the weird part is, he seems to knit clothes for the souls he's taken and the people he's killed. And this reminds me of a story called The Wayfish Woman, who will do the same thing. It's really wild that when you get kind of into all this, that you find out that there are so many correlations and so many similar stories from all around the world. You have to wonder, like, what's the originator? Where do they all come from? And this last one is no different than those. It's called the Voidanoi. It's once again in Slavic mythology. Basically, this creature always lives alone. There's only one of them. And what it does is it drowns unsuspecting humans. If you swim after sunset, 
and neglect to make the sign of the cross before you take a dip, or if you go swimming on a holy day, the Voidenoi may come for you and drown you. And one thing too that I love about the Eastern European mythology and cryptids and all that stuff is just how intense they are. Because here in North America, our countries are so spread out and vast that we're always discovering new stuff or new horrifying things. But in Eastern Europe, it's so close together and it's like, oh yeah, don't go swimming in that lake or else the Voidenoi will get you. And these stories go back hundreds and hundreds of years. It's really interesting and I could probably talk about it all day, but I think I'll end it off here because I've been talking for 20 minutes now and I'm sure that you're tired of hearing me. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this episode and make sure to uh, check out Sunday's video, which will also be on Eastern Europe. So I hope you have a good weekend. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, make sure to like and subscribe and comment and all that great stuff. There are links down below if you want to send in a story of your own or donate to the channel. And there's super thanks here on YouTube. And with that, I'll see you in the next one. Make sure to tune in on Sunday for more encounters from Eastern Europe. Thank you for pulling up a stump and thank you for watching. Make sure to follow the three H's of the channel and I'll see you then.